thank you for joining us here today. My name is Megan Williams, and I'm the Director of Support Services at Alzheimer Group. If you're joining us for the first time, Alzheimer Group supports families and people living with dementia through counseling, activity center, and education. Today's lecture is made possible by the generous support of the Lindsay Memorial Foundation and the Lasner Learning Center. AGI is a charitable organization and we rely on supportive donations. This is a free lecture, but if you would like to donate, you can call the office or visit our website at any time. Our contact info will be sent with you through the email with the survey at the end of, of the day. Just to let everyone know, they will be kept on mute. You can use the chat function or the Q&A function if you have a question for Professor Keller, and we will hopefully have time at the end to answer any of your questions. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce you Professor Heather Keller, who will be guiding us through food and mealtime supporting someone living with dementia. Professor Keller is a registered dietitian professor, um, and I'm sorry, I'm gonna mispronounce this, uh, Schlegel, is that Schlegel. it? Schlegel. Schlegel, sorry, thank you. Schlegel Research Chair in Nutrition and Aging. Her work focuses on improving food and fluid intake and the mealtime experience of older adults living in residences and community and supporting those living with dementia to improve their health and quality of life through food intake. In 2019, Professor Keller received the Mary Tell uh, Marie Teller Taylor Award of Excellence in Long-Term Care Seniors Nutrition and Dietetic Practice. So please, Professor Keller, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Megan. And it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I have, as, as Megan indicated, a real interest in persons living with dementia and their family care partners. And I'm so pleased to be here speaking with you today and hearing what your issues are and how they can be better supported. So just a few disclosures for you. Key is that there's no commercial interest in this presentation today. So I wanted to just briefly talk about food and the brain in general, very, very briefly, and really then focus in on post-diagnosis, um, things to consider with respect to nutrition and food and meal times. As you're likely very aware, our brain health is very much dependent on our overall health. And we now know that individuals who start to have cognitive changes, there are some key risk factors that potentially lead to those cognitive changes, specifically midlife obesity, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, and diabetes. So obviously diet has an impact because it in, in, is involved in these other conditions, right? So we think about antioxidants, for example, to heart, help our heart health or anti-inflammatory nutrients that can support um, living well. These can also uh, change our risk with respect to diabetes or hypertension. When we control our blood glucose or decrease our salt intake or modify our blood lipids by what we eat and decrease our calories to lose weight, these all can have a benefit to brain health, especially in the middle years. So there's a very strong connection between our brains and our body health and what we eat. We know as well that a healthy diet pattern has been linked to again, prevention of uh, dementia and changes in cognition with age. And this healthy diet pattern is pretty consistent. Some call it Mediterranean, some call it the mind diet, some call it the brain health food guide, but it has very similar components regardless of what we may call it uh, and a specific pattern of eating. It's eating lots of what we call whole foods and foods that are high in antioxidants and anti-inflammatory nutrients. So vegetables, leafy greens, cruciferous vegetables, that'd be things like broccoli and cabbage and Brussels sprouts, fruit and specifically berries, unsalted nuts, butters, nut butters and walnuts specifically, fish, seafood and specifically fatty fish, beans, lentils, olive oil, moderate coffee use and green tea. So all of these foods uh, or uh, food components have been found to be linked to a better uh, healthy diet pattern that seems to be preventative with respect to our brain health. 
things to avoid are similar to when we think about cardiovascular disease or cancer or other chronic diseases, these same foods are detrimental as well to brain health. So saturated fat, excessive red meat, processed meats, I got a picture of a hot dog here, processed foods that are high in salt and fat, and excessive alcohol intake. So again, those things are ones we'd like to avoid if possible to help preserve our brain health. The challenge is we actually have very limited research about what foods can promote brain health post a diagnosis. Um, it's much, much more limited. And so I won't be able to reflect so much on that detail, but on some of the other things with respect to uh, weight changes and meal times, which is where my research has been the last 20 years or so. So after the diagnosis, um, we have to still feed our bodies, right? And so a healthy diet, regardless of its potential impact on brain health, will have other benefits to our health. So we advocate that people try to still follow that healthy diet pattern I just showed on the prior two slides. Remembering, of course, that the person has other conditions that they also might want to prevent or manage, like diabetes or hypertension. And so following a healthy diet for those conditions will obviously benefit the, the individual. However, we also notice that as people progress with dementia, they tend to lose body weight. And there's a variety of reasons for that that I'll go through. And so it becomes a balancing act with eating well for in terms of healthiness and nutrients, so those anti-inflammatory and antioxidant nutrients, to also eating at all, quite frankly, and eating enough to promote maintenance of weight uh, and structure of the body. And we'll talk about that in a bit more detail, as I said. So there is this balancing act that happens. We have to live with that tension. And sometimes eating at all is more important than eating healthfully because an individual may not have a very good appetite. So getting enough nutrients is a key concern when persons have dementia. We know that the brain uses about 25% of the energy. So when the person is not consuming enough calories, this can affect the brain itself. In addition, the brain is composed of nutrients, and this is why the link between a healthy diet and our brain health. So we have to eat enough, eat the right things. Vascular damage, oxidative stress, inflammation are all moderated by specific nutrients, as I noted on the healthy diet slide. There is some thought that suboptimal intake of micronutrients like vitamins and minerals could potentially be involved in progression of the dementia. However, the, the, um, the evidence is very, very limited as I noted here. So diet is definitely important with respect to persons living with dementia, but we want to focus in on just getting enough in as well. So weight loss can have a variety of outcomes. And I'll talk about why weight loss happens in a future slide, but weight loss, regardless of having dementia as an older adult has negative outcomes. We know that when a person loses weight, they tend to, and they're, and they're an older adult, so over the age of 65 years of age, they tend to lose also muscle if they're not exercising. So if they lose weight just through diet only, either intentionally or unintentionally, they will also lose muscle and not just fat. This then results in functional impairment. So having weaker legs, weaker arms, etc. Challenges then with going up and down the stairs, picking up items, being able to tolerate sitting up for long periods of time. Those would all be signs of functional impairment with age because of muscle loss. In addition, you can see on the left-hand side that when an individual loses body weight as an older adult, they also are more prone to what we call pressure injuries. So uh, on, the, on their backside or on their shoulders where they're sitting, they'll get what we call pressure injury that can degrade quickly and become a very significant sore that is very challenging to heal. And weight loss is part of that uh, reason why these happen. Infections are more common. So our immunity is obviously affected by our nutritional status and sufficient body weight supports our immune status. Individuals who lose weight tend to also um, be not drinking enough and we see delirium happening. We see falls, 
fractures, hospitalization, and also care partner burden when an individual is losing body weight. Poor nutrition status then is obviously impacting their health and their quality of life. So this is why we try to pay more attention as a person progresses with dementia to maintaining their body weight um, rather than trying to lose body weight. So why does weight loss happen with dementia? In fact, weight loss has sometimes been noted even before dementia occurs. And when Alois, Alois Alzheimer actually diagnosed the first person with dementia, weight loss was one of the key symptoms they identified. There's also been several studies, longitudinal studies we call them, where they watch people over years and years and identified that weight loss um, occurs often before the diagnosis of dementia. So there's something going on with respect to dementia and weight loss for sure. There's many reasons why we see weight loss. I'll show you on the next slide some of those key reasons that uh, we see weight loss with dementia based on the stages of dementia. And we'll talk more about those for the rest of the presentation today. It could be also associated with brain shrinking in areas that control appetite, it may be linked to the genes that are associated with dementia. It may be resulting because of changes in the brain that are around the olfaction or smell system in the body, which then leads to poor food intake. And studies that have been done around weight, weight loss and dementia show that it, it, it occurs with the dementia and also is associated with progression of dementia. We see this weight loss happening. So it's really important to acknowledge when weight loss is, is happening and monitor for that, as well as try to slow it down or stop it altogether, both for the nutrition and overall health of the person, but potentially for the progression of the dementia. So this slide shows stages of dementia very crudely plotted out as early, middle, and late, and some of the changes we see with respect to food and activities related to food uh, at these stages of dementia. So for example, in the early stages, we might see challenges grocery shopping or doing the cooking, setting the table, forgetting to eat, eating strategies with respect to thinking about when they might eat and how they might eat, reduced appetite, sensory changes, specifically smell and taste, but also vision, depression, and ability to adapt to changing situations because of the dementia. In the middle stages, we see, start to see self-feeding challenges, so not being able to use utensils in the same way as they were in the past, moving more towards finger foods. Preferences change. We hear family members talk about the fact that they no longer like what they usually would have for breakfast. They, re, they have decided they like some other foods, and so um, or they prepare our product, and the person says, I don't like this. I never have liked this food. And so there's these change in preferences that are happening. Food choice, make it, they find it challenging sometimes to choose what they want to eat. Um, leaving the table before the meal is done. Communication changes that make it challenging to understand what the person may want to eat or make those choices. But then at the table as well, having conversation that can lead to a pleasurable experience. And then finally, attention. So attention to completing the entire meal, for example. In the late stages, we see things like difficulty self-feeding. So the person loses the capacity eventually to feed themselves. We can see swelling problems uh, that make it challenging to consume a regular diet. Refusing food. So when being offered food by someone else, refusing or turning their head away. Loss of verbal communication and even loss of food recognition. So what is a food? So how common are these challenges? Sakai in 2015 actually looked at 220 people who were going to a dementia clinic as outpatients. So these people lived in the community and they compared them to 30 people who did not have dementia. And you can see that I've made the slide here in the table based on the stage of the dementia and the group with no dementia at the end on the right hand side of the table. So swallowing difficulties, you can see even in the early stages of dementia, so someone perhaps coughing or um, clearing their throat when they're drinking a fluid versus late stage, about half were having significant problems with swallowing as compared to no dementia, only about 17%. 
loss of appetite, similarly you see it increase over time and with the progression of dementia and quite different from people, those without dementia. Appetite increase though also, as you can see here, what we call hyperphagia happens and you can see it in the late stages as well. Food preferences, um, much different than again, no dementia going from anywhere from a third of people to a half of people indicating they're changing food preferences and trying to match that with what is being prepared. Eating habits change. This would be things like um, challenges with respect to using utensils, for example, a variety of habits that could happen. And so it's quite prevalent, as you can see, in the middle and late stages. And then finally, other behaviors. So obviously, food and nutrition become a key area of concern for families living with dementia in the community because of these changes. And you can see how some of them, like, for example, loss of appetite or swelling, because of their prevalence can lead to weight loss. In a more recent study that I did with my student, uh, Cindy Way, we actually, this was during COVID, so it was kind of hard to do, but we did a survey online and a relatively small number of individuals across Canada were able to complete this for us with dementia or with their, or their care partners reporting for them. But regardless, you can see some more detailed um, challenges that people reported who were living with dementia. They talked about lack of interest and motivation to prepare meals, changing appetite again, difficulty deciding what to eat. They really didn't have an appetite for anything. Weight changes, both increase and decrease, changing preferences that were hard to figure out and manage, forgetting about eating, falling conversations at meals, and difficulty using appliances. Care partners similarly have some challenges that they've expressed in prior research. Care partners tend to be spouses and they document or report stress and burden of trying to provide care. This can include food refusal and behaviors that uh, the person with dementia may be expressing that cause stress, like leaving the table and not finishing the, the meal. They also report that their burden and caregiving um, is associated with the weight loss that is seen in the person with dementia. So the question becomes, is it you know, just two things that coincide or is it actually one being involved in the other? We don't really know. But you can imagine that the things that might lead to weight loss can cause stress, obviously in the person that is providing care as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. They also feel uninformed and unsupported in their nutrition issues. And at the end of today, I'll talk about, about some new things that are happening at the University of Waterloo and the RIA that can support some of these areas going forward. <clears throat> They're anxious about weight loss and decreased food intake and how it can be supported. Male care partners specifically are, are feeling stressed about the food roles. So when, they're, when they're, their spouse might have been the person cooking in the past, still wants to be involved, still feels like they should be involved, but there are some challenges perhaps. And how does the male care partner um, help support that involvement at the same time as being involved in some shape or form and not taking over the role? Coping though can be maladaptive. And so people talked about using more takeout and then foods that are higher in salt and fat as a way to adapt to the challenges that are being um, expressed and, and lived through. They also reported poor self-care and these care partners also had some nutrition risk. So it's really a family that's living with dementia, right? And so there's nutrition challenges that also can happen for the care partner as well. Again, when Cindy, uh, we had a, this survey across Canada more recently, the care partners also described lack of time to prepare meals with other caregiving activities. Cooking with the person with dementia was a concern or a challenge. Understanding and matching food preferences, especially if they didn't jive with the person who was making the food. Socializing at meals was found to be a concern and grocery shopping with the person with dementia coming along and some challenges there that people expressed. So now let's switch our attention to some general strategies that can be used to maintain nutrition status. And then we'll talk about some specific things like uh, being involved in activities around cooking and shopping. So first off, exercise if you can. Exercise is key to maintaining mobility, 
maintaining that muscle mass, supports appetite, has huge benefits with respect to the way we feel about ourselves, our emotional state. And so exercise in general is hugely important, regardless of dementia, but with dementia, it's been found to be a real bonus in terms of helping people cope and manage and also socialize with others. So really key is to exercise. Second would be eat with others when you can. We know that eating is a social activity and it's really important as a person progresses with dementia when there are challenges to keep that social focus. This might be the key time that a person is socially involved. And so trying to have that social interaction of eating with others, even if it's being silent while someone else is chatting is a way to feel connected to others. Eat a variety of foods every day, focusing where you can on healthy foods. Find a preferred water bottle. I actually am doing some research around hydration and long-term care, and we find that people prefer their own vessels. I actually have found a water bottle that I prefer versus another, and it leads to my drinking more. And so if you try out different water bottles and what might go better, or even cups or mugs, what the person prefers, use that because it's going to feel comfortable in the hand, easier to drink from, more likely to be then consuming fluids. View mealtimes, grocery shopping and cooking as meaningful self-care activities, not just a task to be done. Think of it really as an opportunity to be together, to socialize and to eat well. Monitor body weight and nutrition risk. So when appetite goes down or weight starts to go down, think about asking your physician around a referral to a dietitian, <clears throat> excuse me, or getting support. Take a multivitamin. In general, for older adults, I do suggest a multivitamin. It's a general insurance, I would say, for health um, when you know you're not eating as well as you can. And older adults need more vitamin D than younger adults do for their bone health. So again, a vitamin D supplement is worthwhile. If your multivitamin doesn't have calcium, make sure it does have some calcium. Find one that does, uh, about three to 500 milligrams a day and B12 as well in that multivitamin supplement. Reason being these three nutrients are needed more in older adults than in younger adults. Also get your serum vitamin D and B12 checked regularly. Vitamin B12, about 30% of older adults will not have a high enough level of B12. It might be because of medications they're taking or what they're eating as well. And so it's really important to make sure you check your B12 because there is linkages to um, brain health with B12. So those are some general strategies to think about with respect to diet and eating well. Now let's move on to some key conditions. So if a person is losing weight, focus in on nutrient and energy dense foods and frequent offerings of those foods. So like six times a day rather than three meals. Think about planning eating every couple of hours. So what would be some examples of energy dense foods? Well, uh, whole milk, for example, whole fat cheeses, using um, base cell margarine in a generous amount on your bread, as well as peanut butter or nut butters. They tend to be high in energy, right? Uh, nutrient dense foods, protein specifically as well. So think about high fat yogurt. Um, think about um, also um, fatty fish. Think about um, some desserts that might be more nutritious, but also higher in fat that might have chocolate, for example, or nuts in them um, to have that higher nutrient uh, density as well as energy density. Try to provide preferences. People will eat what they like. So if someone's asking for something, then provide it. Respect individual's choices. Use oral nutrition supplements if they're accepted. And you can make some homemade versions as well. You can make smoothies at home that are high in nutrients and protein. And we can talk a bit about that at the end if you like for some recipe ideas. This is where it's important to speak to a physician as well and get some um, guidance around micronutrient deficiencies that may be happening. Getting, seeing a dietitian and, and examining what is being actually consumed where there might be some micronutrient problems to make sure they're caught early and supplemented properly. So again, referral to dietitian is really important here uh, to make sure that that weight loss can be managed well. We're now going to shift to thinking about 
eating together and some challenges that may happen around mealtimes. And so I've got a couple of quotes. I had the pleasure of doing a study um, about starting around 2004 or five and conducting it for about six years of families, 26 families who are living with dementia in the community. We followed them for six years and we did interviews with them, just qualitative interviews, asking them about what was meaningful about mealtime, how they were coping. And a lot of our thoughts and strategies came out of the, from this group. So these are two quick quotes I'll just read out for you. I think together, whatever you do together strengthens a relationship. Eating obviously is critical because some people eat three or four times a day. So again, back to the notion that the mealtime isn't just a task. Think of it as a key enrichment activity of life when living with dementia and, for, and without dementia, right? It really is a key uh, family activity. <clears throat> Consequently, thus, no time is a main time when we talk. If otherwise, I feel like I'm interfering. I can feel it. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so this was a person with dementia whose partner was still working. And uh, she worked from home. And he felt like he needed to not interrupt her. So mealtimes for them was the key time to be social. So how do we make mealtimes the most they can be? Focus that interest and attention on mealtimes. So make it a bit of a ritual. Keep routines and traditions that have been started where you can. Sit at the table, for example. Um, take the time for having a calm environment, sufficient time to eat. Avoid interruptions if you can. Sit near the window, listen to the radio, read letters and emails from family members or others as a way to make it a social focused time. Use conversation aids that focus on opinions rather than facts. For example, at breakfast, you can look at the paper and read a piece out and talk about that. Talk about the day, talk about food, reminisce, laugh. Gently redirect conversation if it becomes repetitive. Recognize as well that listening is participation. So if the person isn't chatting very much who has dementia, use the radio as a way to provide that participation and you as a care partner, then perhaps remarking on things. Be flexible and recognize that differences in capacity happen. One day to the next, people may have different interests in conversation or being involved in the meal. Make meals visually appealing where you can. Choose color, table setting, uh, placemat, dishes, the food itself. And keep the interest up by trying new foods and recipes. This is a way to keep it interesting and trying new things. It's another part of a relationship. I think it actually makes a little closer, you know, because you spend time in the kitchen together. You're chopping and cutting, you know, working away, doing something together. So what did our care partners say about working in the kitchen to, together around activities? And what were some strategies? So doing those food activities together, provide encouragement, get involved, realize things can take longer for sure, but everybody can have a role in the mealtime in some shape or form. It may be putting things into the dishwasher, it may be rinsing the dishes, maybe washing something. Everybody can be involved, including the person with dementia. So finding those ways to have that meaningful role in the meal is key. People feel then they've contributed, right? Everybody, no matter if they have dementia or not, feel like they've contributed to this meaningful activity in the family. So provide encouragement to be involved. See the individual, not the activity. So if a person um, is taking longer to do something, I'll give you an anecdote again from eating together. One of our care partners, a lovely gentleman and his wife, she had dementia. She would fill the dishwasher at the, um, at the end of a meal. And she often would do things upside down in the dishwasher or whatever, and then go lie down after the meal. He would then fix it in the dishwasher, make sure the dishes actually got cleaned. But his, the point of doing that, rather than criticizing her when she was doing the dishes, let her do it and then come back later and fix it if it needs to be fixed, shows that keeping the person feeling like they were participating was more important than the activity itself getting done the right way. 
focus on an individual's current strength, if they like to wash, if they like to cut the vegetables, if they like to you know, be involved in, in um, tasting the food or, or stirring the pot, and that's something they want to do, then use that strength and where their interests currently lie. Overlook mistakes. Be flexible in the tasks and the approach taken. So every day, just sort of realizing where people are at. Today is not a good day to perhaps be the one stirring the pot because they're feeling, you know, um, not good with the steam or whatever it may be. Today might be a better day. Just sit at the counter and chat with the cook instead. Spend time discussing and planning meals. Meals are a big part of our lives, right? And we seem to have forgotten that time of just thinking about food and, and planning for food. It itself can build excitement, interest, and be meaningful. Adapt roles and tasks. Break down things into little steps. Provide the opportunity for repetitive tasks, of so stirring a pot, for example, or washing the vegetables. And be appreciative. I remember, again, in the Eating Together study, this one family, um, the very first year, the husband actually did not communicate very much at all. And, um, and she would always um, appreciate it when he came into the kitchen and would just fold up the towels and leave them there after the dishes were done. And she would thank him uh, and, and showing that little bit of appreciation for being involved in even that small task in the kitchen. Well, I catch up her activities and it makes me feel more like a part of her life and she a part of mine. Um, it gives me something else to think about besides what's going on in my own little house, broadens the neighborhood. She picks it up when like they're talking to other people. She participates within her ability to do so. So here we're gonna talk about some strategies for participating in the mealtime and conversation, eating out or with others. So when eating out, for example, you're going out with a group of people or they're coming to your home, different people, rehearse the names beforehand and the connections. So those recalls are a little bit perhaps more um, automatic. Generally, redirect, redirect conversation becomes repetitive. Suggest a potluck or takeout when entertaining. So rather than putting all the stress on yourself as a care partner and the person to mention to host, to then suggest that people bring things instead. Simplify the menu and narrow down choices. If again, if you're having other people come to the table. Familiar foods and places when eating out are a good idea. Go at off times and sit in quiet areas. If the person uh, has moved away from using utensils, go to places where handheld foods are normal. For example, um, a place where there might be a hamburger or a sandwich that can be held. And guide behavior where, where it's appropriate to do so. Thinking about um, connecting, mealtimes, as I said, are a huge part of a family in terms of connection. So how can we keep those connections going? And in addition to that, what we call maintaining dignity, so making the person with dementia feel like they're valued, that they're important to the family. Key things that our care partners and persons with dementia said, let go of some of the things that are causing the stress in your life that you don't have to do anymore. There are often less meaningful routines and traditions that you can let go of and keep those that are meaningful to you. Avoid embarrassment. So for example, I give here, if a person has a very low appetite, rather than loading up their plate and then them feeling embarrassed that they can't eat it all, just give a smaller portion from the beginning. You can always get more later, right? If the person wants more. Overlook mistakes. Leave things that are difficult unsaid. So just gloss over, right? And, and forgive those mistakes and don't worry about it. And seek to understand opinions and desires rather than trying to, and promoting that dignity uh, to keep that connection going. Some key eating challenges that people talk about are challenges with using utensils, for example, leaving the table, um, not having conversation as much in the past as they, as they are now. What can be done? 
So consider finger foods. Most foods I had, um, I remember I used to joke that my daughter, who she's now 19, uh, but when she was a child, she actually didn't use utensils till she was about seven or eight. She just refused to. And so I used to say, most foods are finger foods, even salads are finger food in our house. Um, so you think about using uh, what can be a finger food. And in our house, we still, instead of salad, we actually make up vegetables and have them cut up in a, in a plastic container and we pull that out at every meal. And it's just finger food. Uh, something easy to make sure we're getting lots of vegetables in. Think about things that can be portable. If a person doesn't stay at the table to eat a full meal, what can be portable? A smoothie, for example, in a, a cup, uh, a takeaway mug that has a lid, easy way to walk around the house with a straw to consume that food if they're safe and not choking. Other things that might be portable, uh, for example, cheese and crackers, um, think about uh, peanut butter sandwich, those can be taken around the house, might lead to a little bit of mess, sure, but uh, certainly get the food in if someone is wandering or wayfaring and doesn't stay seated for long periods of time. Think about, um, I, I already mentioned smoothies, but wraps could be another thing as well. Um, sometimes they can be a bit messy depending on what they contain, but uh, that may be another way to have a portable food. Offering soup in a cup, that's easier than trying to use a spoon to eat the soup. If the food is moving around or the plate is moving around the table when someone's using one hand, for example, to cut uh, the food, you can put a washcloth, a wet washcloth underneath the plate and it won't move as much to promote conversation, but also to promote behaviors of eating. So picking up a mug, for example, um, I do a lot of work for persons living in residential care. And we know that something that's called mimicry really helps a person with using something like a cup. So someone who's facing them also picks up a cup and touches it. That person across from them with dementia is more likely to pick up their cup and also drink from it. So using that face-to-face -face and cueing helps to automatically support food intake. Provide verbal and physical cues, such as putting the utensil on a person's hand and then saying, you know, now it's time to pick up that spoon with, uh, or pick up, pick up that food with a spoon, or even loading the food onto the spoon. And once it gets going, it might then take over the natural uh, motor skills come back. So chewing and swallowing problems. This is often seen in the community and, and people are really perplexed by this. They're not sure what to do. The hardest um, things to swallow is a thin fluid, actually, like water, for example, or coffee and tea. You might have noticed this yourself, um, persons having dementia or care partners. I myself, I'm over 50 now. I find I sometimes catch that I will sputter a bit on water. Uh, it's a natural, I shouldn't say natural, it happens with age uh, because of muscle changes in the throat. Uh, but with dementia, it seems to be progressive. And so water is one of those things that's the hardest things to swallow. And so taking a mindful uh, sip is key. Here's some lists though of things that um, are, can also be done to support um, eating when someone does have a chewing or swallowing difficulty. So checking with a dentist or dentist, there might be something wrong with dentures. They might not be fitting as well as they did in the past and it's worth the investment. I know that my mom is uh, 97 years old and she just bought her first wheelchair. She really balked at the expense and I said, mom, it's worth it because it gets you around where you need to go. Think of these things as investment as well. Good eyeglasses, good hearing aids, good dentures. Uh, they're worth the investment, right? In terms of eating and staying well. A speech language pathologist can be found through home care who can support um, identifying what the specific swallowing challenge may be and support an individual with um, assessment. In Quebec, uh, where most of you, I believe, are, are living at this point, dietitians are also involved in doing swallowing assessments in the community. Some people find that solids are also a challenge. Um, they, they feel sticky in the mouth. And so having a glass of water to make the person sure you're well hydrated before eating a meal is a good idea because it can moisten all of the, the mouth and the throat and support that swallowing. Chew sw slowly and eat slowly. So take the time of meals. My husband actually has um, Bell's palsy and he had it uh, diagnosed probably almost a decade ago now, he, he immediately had to eat more slowly and still eats more slowly because of that Bell's palsy. And so it's just, you just have to accept, accept that um, there's 
changes with respect to the slowness of eating that can be required when it comes to eating and trying to prevent chewing and swallowing problems. And so it's really important just to slow down eating, slow down meals, make that time for conversation and for being together. Smooth and soft foods are often preferred again if we start to see that a person has challenges with solids um, it's usually the crumbly things and the hard things uh, that are first noted as being a swollen problem and so think about casseroles um, anything that has hard bits to avoid those or what we call mixed textures as well um, so it might be like for example fruit cocktail it has the liquid and the fruit itself and also those fruits are different textures that can be hard to manage. There might be one small bit of pineapple that's really hard to chew with the liquid. And that's where we see some coughing happening or choking when someone is trying to eat it. So try to use things that are more cohesive, that are moist, that are smooth. Nutrition, li nutritious liquids should be focused on. So again, here we can make smoothies um, using um, skim milk powder or those protein powders that you can buy and making um, a smoothie with fruit, with uh, milk or soy uh, beverage as a way to meet nutrient needs. And it's a little bit thicker than a thin liquid. And once you thicken a fluid, it slows it down and it makes it easier to swallow in the mouth and into the pharynx. Already mentioned the idea of using sauces to moisten food and fluids that are slightly thicker tend to be managed better. Again, avoid the grainy bits, skins and dry and doughy breads, white bread especially, untoasted, very doughy, can feel like it's stuck here um, and hard to get down. And finally, learn first aid if you can. So I know I've spoken for about 40 minutes or so, so now, so just some big takeaways that I hope that you have from today. And also to, to let you know where there's some further information where you can go for more, more details. Remember that food is definitely nutrients and it feeds our body, but beyond our body, it feeds our mind and our soul. And so food is pleasure, um, absolutely. Food is, um, as we age, becomes more pleasurable, I think. And uh, for people living in long-term care, for example, like my mom, clothes and jewelry and, and uh, other things are no longer pleasurable to her. She can't necessarily um, play games the way she used to, but food is still a very much a huge pleasure. So take the time and use that uh, food as pleasure. Food is also a meaningful activity in families and make it that, not just a task to be quickly done and a meal to got, get through and feed our bodies, but think about feeding our souls and minds as well. For persons with dementia and for all families, it's a way of connecting. It's a way of upholding our dignity and, and our personhood, who we are as an individual. And it's a way of helping us adapt to our evolving life, regardless of living with dementia, but especially when living with dementia. So I'll leave it there, Megan, and I'll just show a couple slides of here's some places where there's some really good information for you. The Brain Health Food Guide is meant for prevention of dementia, but it describes some of those healthy food and the eating patterns for persons who are preventing dementia. I would say the same foods would be appropriate for people living with dementia. And then there's some guidance here from the Alzheimer's Society around food and eating um, that are helpful as well. And then just uh, some acknowledgments of my lab thank you so much professor keller i find um you know i i run many support groups and uh my team uh counseling families and the biggest thing that we often hear is that they are saddened by the lack of conversation during mealtime i think this is a huge loss for a lot of spouses um, even in the earlier stages of the disease, because we, we find that a person becomes very task focused um, and the conversation isn't the same where they can't necessarily talk about their day, talk about what they're going to do on the weekend and things like that. So I really appreciate your um, emphasis on how to make mealtime a little bit more um, flexible, adaptable, but, but try to make it as meaningful as possible. Um, Please, uh, for anyone, you can definitely um, add any questions or, or comments in the chat. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, at the end you were mentioning choking and you went through your slides about 
maybe even a thickener. When will families know it's the right time to, to use a thickener and can they do this themselves or should they contact a professional first? I would definitely contact a professional because um, again, my husband has Bell's palsy and he still has this, this, the residual side effects. He coughs all the time when he eats and drinks. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think if, if I immediately jumped to thickening his fluids, it would affect his hydration. My husband is a 56 year old person living in the community, working, doing all those things. Right. And so I think we can sometimes over um, jump to conclusions when we see something. So definitely seek out the advice and expertise of a health professional to really find out, is it a swallowing challenge that has to be managed by change in diet? Because you don't, especially when I jump to thickeners, um, they tend to be one extremely expensive to um, many people, the commercial thickeners, over time, um, they don't drink enough, quite frankly, because it's not as palatable as drinking fluid. They don't feel like it addresses their thirst very well. Um, and, and three, there's other things you could do besides commercial thickeners, right? There's uh, smoothies, for example, are naturally thickened fluids. Um, and knowing what thickness is appropriate for the person is key. So you're not over thickening it either. Um, so that's key, getting that assessment. Okay. Would that be um, a a dietitian? Would that be an occupational therapist? Like who, I know it might be different in Montreal, but who would be able to? Yeah, in Quebec, dietitians are, um, uh, with the OPDQ, are similarly trained and certified to be doing uh, uh, language, um, sorry, uh, to do swallowing assessments as speech language therapists. Um, Speech language therapists are also key. Um, sometimes an occupational therapist will also be trained in swallowing assessments, but usually it's going to be a dietitian or speech language pathologist. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, someone had written, how often do you suggest the serum vitamin D and um, B12 be checked? Yeah. You mentioned check it regularly. Once, once a year. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, another question that I had um, what are your thoughts on Insure as a supplement? Uh, I think they're all quite similar, uh, frankly. Um, you go with what tastes good. Uh, there'll be different variations on the same theme or the same brand. So you'll see um, whether it be that product or another brand, they'll have formulations that are higher in protein or higher in calories. They tend to be more expensive too and thicker. So it really depends on the individual, what they prefer. Um, homemade versions are just as good, quite frankly. Um, uh, you can take something, um, we used to make this uh, carnation instant breakfast. It's got all the vitamins and minerals in it. You add milk to it, um, add whole milk instead and a little bit of skim milk powder. Now you've got a, a, a product that's just as good, right? Okay, probably so, less expensive too. Exactly. So, so go with what works for you, what you prefer. Um, but I find that certainly the vitamins and minerals are a bonus, but it's really what people mostly are getting is the energy and protein from these products. If they're taking multivitamin, right. Uh, you know, in addition, it's really about the weight that they're worried about. And so in that case, there's lots of options homemade as well as those they're convenient. Absolutely. Um, but over time people can get tired of the taste and tired of the feel in their mouth. So just to be aware of that, that if people say, no, I don't want any more, switch it up, try a different one. Right. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Um, there's also, I mean, we've seen sometimes where you've talked a lot about weight loss and mm-hmm. you said that the weight can change. Sometimes we've actually seen weight gain, especially in the gut area. Is that specifically, can you speak a little bit about that? Well, that's age, right? Okay. <laughs> when it goes to the center, that's an age thing. Uh, all of us get that if we eat too much. And so you do see though, what we call hyperphagia often in the middle stages of dementia. Um, I don't get too excited about it, quite frankly, because often that ends and then the person will maintain and then they will eventually move to weight loss um, over time. So um, I only get really excited about if their diabetes gets out of control um, and then you then you, you'd want to make sure what you're offering, um, you're offer foods that um, are going to be not stimulating that glucose uh, challenge that they're having with their, their insulin. Um, I would offer foods and make sure what you have on the table is 
more low calorie, but it's, it's, it's sort of an oral need that people have to keep eating. And some types of dementia, frontal temporal dementia, for example, specifically, they tend to gain weight um, and then eventually will lose that weight. And it's again, it's the in disinhibition that's that's, you know, the, the issue here. Right. Um, they just can't stop eating. So then offer things that are low calorie. So instead of chips, have plain popcorn. Uh, they need something to to be constantly eating. Um, have a glass, have a water bottle rather than, and that may satisfy the need to have, be doing something with their mouth, right? So those would be the strategies I would suggest: popsicles, things that are relatively low in calories that they can constantly be eating um, and not going overboard. Uh, vegetables, celery sticks if they're safe to swallow those things, right? Having those low calorie options that seem to fill you up and take time to eat would be the focus. Okay. Is there any tricks to get someone to slow down in yeah. eating? I, I, I know that, you know, the idea is to put less food on the plate and, and make it more frequently and space it out. But is there anything that you can do to, to guide that? Yeah. Um, you, you, there's a tension between slowing down by making it more difficult to eat and causing choking, right? And so I, I think the, the safety is where I err on and don't get so concerned about the swiftness of the eating. Um, <clears throat> I think what happens for care partners is they're still eating. The person's rushed, eaten, and then walked away, right? It gets very distressing that the meal is, yeah. well, I made this meal and it's just disappeared and now the person is gone. That's that's where you're at right now. And so acceptance is one of those things that, to work with, right? You, you, you know, you've made a wonderful, nutritious meal that you enjoy and they enjoyed, but they enjoyed quickly. That's that's. First, acceptance is perhaps the key thing. Second is making sure they're safe. Um, so again, when people eat quickly, they can choke, right? So making sure whatever is provided is either cut up or very soft and easy to consume would be a key strategy. Um, try other things that keep them at the table. So it may or may not work. Um, the radio on having something to read there or something else to focus in on the table. So they could be finished, remove the plate, but maybe they could stay and, and do something else at the table with you. Um, maybe they like to do something with their hands, a puzzle, bring it there and, and have the puzzle and the, be at the table together that way. It really is individual, Megan. It's so hard to give these recommendations because mm -hmm. seriously is, is, is individual person to person. And we can give strategies to try. Um, and I think care partners are incredibly resilient people and, and resourceful, right? So I, I would say, I, I get it. I understand how um, challenging it is when you've made a meal that you want to enjoy and the person quickly eats and then they're like, where's, can I have some more or walks away? And it, it can be really challenging. So it's, I, I think perspective is part of the solution on the care partner side to not get upset, to just accept. And, you know, you made a wonderful meal. He, he or she is safe. And now you're enjoying the meal with the radio on. That might be the best you've got. Right. Yeah. The, the idea of eating a meal together um, for some families, I mean, it's so important. And obviously as a person's diet changes where they have to have, you know, either thickened food or more finger foods. Um, is there any book or anything that you would recommend with recipes that would be kind of to make sure that the person feels included and so that obviously we don't want to um, burden the caregiver with more making two different meals, but is there anything that um, they could kind of either, if they do have to make two different meals, because that's just the reality, that yeah. would kind of complement, um, you know, what the, the care partner is eating versus the person who has more challenges. Yep. Yep. So I would suggest things like casseroles for the care partner, they could have that to eat and that's readily minced or pureed, right? Mm -hmm. So already pick those softer foods for yourself to eat and then quickly process it, whatever it may be to get it to the texture you need to get it to. Most foods can be pureed pretty pretty basically with um, a good quality food processor at home with a bit of nutritious fluid or even a little bit of water. Um, there aren't too many good pureed food cookbooks out there. They tend to make it as a pureed food, but for, for people living at home with a person with dementia, 
quite frankly, play a little bit with the food. But if you start with an already a softer food yourself, having um, uh, say it's Chinese food that you've ordered in or whatever you've made, it can be minced up very nicely um, and provided, right? And still have all those flavors in it. One thing you hear people talking about is perhaps mincing the individual pieces. Let's say it's spaghetti. So you've got spaghetti made with uh, ground meat or ground soy, which I use at home, spaghetti sauce. It's already what I would consider minced texture, but it needs to be a little bit finer for that person with de dementia. You could puree it, right? And have it on the side and cut up the, the pasta very finely. That might be enough to do that. It takes that little bit extra effort for sure. But if you're already starting with a soft food, it's not as hard to do. So many things that you would normally have at home could be readily modified um, with a bit of experimentation. Okay, thanks. And um, one last question that I have was um, about sweet foods mm -hmm. um, that um, we see a lot of people living with dementia, they tend to go for the sweeter foods. Is that part of their sensory changes? Yes. And yes. the second question is how, if, they're, if their appetite is very limited mm -hmm. and um, they tend to go towards the ice cream or something. That's the only way that that care partner can get the person to eat or start the sensation of eating. What are your thoughts on that? Absolutely. So it's, it's that tension that I had at the beginning of the presentation. This is the point where the nutrition isn't as important as getting something in. Right. And uh, I'm, when I used to work in, a, in long term care and chronic care, getting anything in is better than getting nothing in. Absolutely. So if ice cream is, it, there might be a food jag going on. They only want ice cream, ice cream. Absolutely. And then maybe you can put a little pureed fruit on eventually or something else or move, you know, move past the, the start with dessert and then move backwards through the meal. Why not? Absolutely. Who cares? Those, those traditions and routines are things that can change, right? Keep the perspective of what's most important here. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And I am sure a lot of, uh, caregivers are appreciating those guidance because yeah. it is hard to kind of get out of that unconventional way about, you know, whether it's in the, the meal and then the dessert and, and changing things up and adapting. So um, Professor Keller, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I think um, that um, please send us any information about future studies, because I think there are a lot of people living in Quebec and Montreal who might be curious and be a would like to be a part of that. Um, I think that the overall message is to be adaptable, make it as meaningful as you can, and kind of seek out professional guidance if you have questions or you're, you're um, wondering whether or not, um, you know, the challenges are, are normal or, or how to adapt appropriately. So yes. yeah, thank exactly. you. And I can just maybe let folks Absolutely. These two projects we're working on right now. Uh, one's called Delight. It's a wellness program for care partners and persons living with dementia. We're at the stage of testing it out. So Megan will be sending out an advertisement about that. What it's got in it is exercise virtually. So over Zoom, if you can imagine. And um, a wonderful booklet about um, some interesting recipes that are focused in on healthy eating and a variety of fact sheets around wellness. So sleeping, coping, eating well, and exercise. So that's something you might be interested in getting involved in. The other product is called Dream and it's, um, the website will be launched hopefully in the near future. And I'm going to make sure I get the uh, information to Megan. We're looking for care partners and persons with dementia specifically to look at the resources and tell us what they think about them. But in there are fact sheets talking about things like food jags, like eating challenges, et cetera. All that is there that we've created and uh, will be helpful, we think, to care partners and persons with dementia and also wellness or what we call service providers in the community. So Megan, you and your colleagues could be part of it as well. We're wanting to try to um, promote exercise and healthy eating across, uh, across these groups and know that wellness advocates or service providers are a big part of that. So I'll make sure I send that along to you as well. Please send that to Nin, who's been in touch with you, and she'll make sure at the end of this uh, day, hopefully there'll be a survey that will be sent out just to give some feedback. And uh, we we might be asking you to come back and talk about those projects. So thank you so much and have a wonderful day. Thank Take you. care. Take care. Bye.